Yeah, Memorial Day weekend. Let me tell you, it's more than a barbecue. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, I don't know if you've ever been aware of this, but the, the thought is, is that tomorrow at 3 p.m. that we stop and we pray. We pray for the soldiers. We pray for the families of those who have lost their lives in battle, in war. But tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, take a moment and pray. They asked us, ask us to do that. I don't know if you ever heard that. Ask us to do that all across the nation tomorrow at 3 p.m. So take that time and you might be barbecuing stuff in your face, jumping in the water. I don't know, but let's, you want to say something? <laughs> you know, I, I really just wanted real quickly to give you some direction on that. And, you, you know, it was um, not yesterday, but the day before I was in flame broiler just getting lunch and an older vet came in. And for some reason, it was just the two of us in the waiting room there area. And he just started spewing. And he goes, you know, they hit me. They spit on me. They hated my guts. They called me baby killer. They hated me. But now they love me everywhere I go. But that hurt is so deep. He goes, I just, I can't get over it. He goes, I still have hate in my heart for the, for the pain that I suffered back then. That people would literally call me and accuse me of being a baby killer. He goes, I never even got off the ship. I was in the Navy. He goes, the, the, the horrible treatment that we got when we came back home wasn't what we expected. He goes, it broke my heart. It's still my heart is broken. And I tried to minister to him to let it go because those, most of those people are gone or have been re-educated. And I'm so sorry that you, you went through that, but how much more is there out there that are still hurting that they need a lot of prayer? Amen. Amen. So do that tomorrow, 3 PM. Let's join together wherever we're at. You know, the other day I was watching the movie, um, Heartbreak Ridge. And um, Heartbreak Ridge was this ridge there, and they had this big, like, net, but it was rope. But it was like a net hanging down off this cliff. And they had to climb up to the top of the ridge on that net-like rope on the face of that cliff and go to battle. Well, this new group of soldiers was coming in, and as they were driving in, they were seeing soldiers coming from there. They were seeing truckloads of dead soldiers driving away from there. And so while, while these, the dead and the wounded and the people that are all tore up are driving away, they're, they're going towards it. And you can see the, the fear, you know, of where they were going. But they followed their marching orders, even though it may mean death. They obeyed and they moved forward. They climbed that hill and then the machine gun fire started, the mortars started launching, people started dying and, and they pressed forward, pressed forward, pressed forward until the enemy had all these people come out from underground and were just rushing them. And then they started retreating back, retreating, retreating back and then down the net, you know, but there was wounded left up there. And the one guy on a private DOS, he, just before he went down the, the rope ladder, he stopped. And he just sat there for a minute and he thought about all the wounded up there because he was a medic. And he went back and he started dragging bodies wounded bodies over to the top of the net, wrapped a rope around them and stuff, and then he'd let them down off that cliff with a big old rope. He'd let them down. And then he'd go get another and get another. And they said that he even brought the enemy down, you know, that he found wounded. He let them down. And he stayed up there all night doing that to where there was, he saved over 70 men in those attacks. And, and, and after he, he, they got down and he, he went back to command and, you know, got a shower, got some food and everything and a little bit of rest. Then it was time to go back up again. You know, can you imagine 
coming down off that mountain and then have to then they tell you, okay, your marching orders, you got to go back up. You got to get back up the top. You got to take this, this cliff. There, the idea is, is to take the, overtake the enemy to stop the tyranny that was happening at that time. And this was you know, the Japanese that they were fighting at that time. And they laid down their lives to do that. They laid down their lives to go up and do it again. They followed their marching orders. The American soldiers showed their love for America by laying down their lives and following all the orders that they were given. Could we stand this morning and put your right hand over your heart and face the flag while Liz sings the national anthem this morning? we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father God, for Jesus coming and laying down his life for each one of us that we would have eternal life. And we thank you, Father God, for that love. We thank you for the American soldier who has laid down their life for the freedom that we have here in America, Father. And we pray a covering and a blessing over them and their families, Father God, that, Lord, that you would be with their families, have lost loved ones, God, and we pray that you would cover them and protect them today, God, that the God of more than enough would just bless them today in Jesus' name. And, Father, we pray for our nation, God, that your hand would be upon our nation, that, Lord, that we would keep standing as one nation under God, indivisible, Father God, indivisible, undivided, Father God, Lord, in the love of you. And Father, I pray that you just be with us in this day. Let your word be life to us today, Father. And bless us as we celebrate who you are today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Amen. Whew. That was good, Liz. I don't know where she's at. <laughs> She does it, but it's hard. After leading worship, <laughs> she gets up there. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you served in the military, I thank you truly from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for serving. It's a blessing. 
You know, you guys don't go where I go. You don't really know what freedoms you have here. You don't go to the people that are, well, even the story on one of the stories I'm going to tell you today, you don't know what's going on around the world to the believer, the punishment that they go under, the suffering that they have. We have such freedom. We need to take advantage of it. Amen? Amen. Well, as we've been talking about marching orders, and that's the title of today, part three, um, we've been talking about our role in the kingdom of God and what our marching orders are. And they are, we need to go. Everybody say, go. Go. Go, and when you go, speak. Say something for the kingdom, amen? And then while you're speaking, get them baptized. You you know, I want to break off something off of people right now. You don't have to bring them here and fill that tank. There's a tank behind that screen. You don't have to bring them here to to get them baptized. You get them saved, take them to the pool and baptize them. You can do that. You believe in Jesus. He didn't say that's just for the pastors to do. Susan, you got a pool, just have a party and dunk them. (laughs) That's where you got baptized. You know, you, you, when you know Jesus, don't think, listen, take the, take the religion out of it. Philip was riding, run, I mean, running along. He caught up to that guy in the chariot. He said, Hey, what's up, buddy? And the guy goes, man, I'm I'm reading this thing and I don't understand it. And he says, why don't you stop? I'll explain it to you. He stopped, he explained it to him, and 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 the guy goes, the Ethiopian guy goes, hey, there's a puddle of water. You think you could baptize me? He says, sure, come on, get down in here. (laughs) Baptize him. And Philip was gone. Lord translate him somewhere else. I mean, can you imagine getting dunked in a puddle of water? (laughs) Woo-hoo! You know, we got a good rain and the gutter water's hot. Let's go. (laughs) Let's have a baptism service. You know, I've been in some places where they're like, they rent a hotel room. They rent a hotel room. I know the last, last time we did it, it was a hotel room that had a hot spring. So the, the water was kind of gross. It was yellow. Because it, it's coming up out of the ground into the hotel, and that was the hot water in the hotel. So we filled up the bathtub in that hotel, and they told the people at the front desk, um, this is an English teacher, and we're having a meeting in the hotel room. Because to explain why all the people were coming to that hotel room. So we gave them a white robe. They got in the tub. And me and my son, Timothy, we baptized them in that hot water. It was an incredible time. And we celebrated. And then I just scoot out the back and go. It's amazing what people will go through. You know, I know people that they go out. They take a bus. They take the, the group of people out by a bus to a river. And they get in that cold, freezing water. And they baptize them in the river. You can see Pastor Alfred's videos online or pictures online where they go to, there's a river not too far from the church and they, they walk from the church up and they march down the street. They do a parade. The people go down to the river. They go in the bushes. They change their clothes. They go down. They step into the river and they get baptized. I met this little kid that had HIV and um, he, he walked up to me and he, after I was done preaching and he just held my hand. Everywhere I went, he just held my hand. He just walked. And he, he had, what are they called? 500 shillings. A 500 shilling coin. This little 10-year-old kid, 500 shilling coin. Now, 500 shilling coin might, see, 3,600 is, 3, is a dollar. So 500 is not that much. You know, not even a quarter. Maybe 15 cents. He had that. And he wanted to take care of me. So he gave it to me. Man, I did not want to take it. I did not want to take it except for the fact that I wanted that kid to be blessed. Now, I didn't know he had HIV. So I'm walking with this kid and I'm holding his hand and everything. And um, I asked him, are you going to the baptism today? Yeah, I'm going. I said, okay, so go down there and he's watching. And I'm in there and I think we baptized like 36 people that day. And he, he wanted to get baptized. He didn't have a change of clothes. So he just stripped down to his skivvies. And he walked out that water. Everybody kind of giggled. And as they giggled, you know, but he stepped down. My heart was, was for him. That as he sat down, I mean, stepped down into that water, I was able to baptize him. It just like, wow. Man, it was so powerful. Then they took me to lunch. And they said, hey, you know that little last kid you baptized? I said, yeah. And they said, he has HIV. And I'm like, oh, I, 
could have gone all day without knowing that one. I called Delonda later that day. I was at the place I was staying. They had a grass area. I called. I started sobbing so hard. She's like, what's going on? I go, I can't do this. It's too much, man. I can't do this. You know, just holding that little kid and he's, he's got HIV, but he just wants to know Jesus. And he wanted to come to America with me, man. My heart was just boom, 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 boom. I just couldn't take it. I just, I sat and I cried so hard. Remember that day? I was broken. Just to be baptized. You want to be baptized? You can sign up in the foyer today. Amen? Then if you need to, look in the mirror and cast out a few demons too, okay? (laughs) Speak in new tongues. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Just ask the Lord, give him my heavenly language and pray in the Spirit. And then if you pick up serpents or drink anything deadly, deadly poison, it'll be okay. Now, remember what I said about that, that the, the, there are people that come about with sly and cunning ways to try to convince you to drink the poison. Let me give you an example. A lot of you young people won't know this, but there was this guy, that uh, a pastor that got the people to drink the green Kool-Aid, and the green Kool-Aid was poison, and he killed his whole congregation down in the jungles of Guyana. I mean, who does that? Don't drink the poison from the serpent, Amen. Don't buy into the junk that the enemy's trying to buy, get you to buy into. Cast it down, throw it down, say, spit it out. I'm not drinking that. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Charles? I mean, you know, because the enemy comes and he'll lie to you. He'll tell you things. It's just like he did to Eve. He'll tell you things. And see, Eve drank the poison. She ate the apple. She did what she wasn't supposed to do, what God told him not to do. See, and every time we do what God told us not to do, we're drinking the poison. But we have this promise. It'll be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to make it through. Just do your best not to listen to the serpent. And don't drink the poison. Don't take in what he's telling you. Don't believe the lies. You know, when, when the enemy tells you, it's okay if you just got this one thing, say, no, it ain't. I got to get rid of this one thing. And then lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Amen. Believe that. Never... Never, ever forget that we have the Lord working with us, amen, and that he's confirming the words that you speak. Everybody say, speak. Speak. We're not alone in this, amen. The Holy Spirit is at work with us to be able to do the things that Jesus has called us to do. We are empowered. We're empowered, amen. And now since we're empowered, let's look at how we should go. Not just doing these things, but our attitude in going is everything. Our attitude in going is everything. How we go and speak is what gives us the opportunity to speak into somebody's life, to bring them to life in the Spirit. How we do it, our attitude in it, makes all the difference. Galatians chapter 5. It's the main scripture focus for today, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. I'll ask the New King James. I kind of like the New Living, too. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. There's no law against these things. How many of you got patience? Wrong answer. How many of you have patience? You all have patience if you have the Spirit. You all have self-control if you have the Spirit. You all have joy, peace, love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness if you have the Spirit. So these things are produced from being filled with the Holy Spirit, amen? Now, my spirit-filled life Bible that I have on my desk, because I, like I like to read a lot of notes on everything, but this is, if you have that Bible, you can read that note in there. This, and I'm going to read it to you today. It says, these virtues are characterized 
as fruit in contrast to works. Only the Holy Spirit can produce them and not our own efforts. So another contrast is that whereas the works of the flesh are plural, you know, because right before the, the, this in Galatians, there's all the works of the flesh that are listed out. Those are plural. The fruit of the Spirit is one and indivisible. So there's only one fruit of the Spirit. You only get one. And in that one, it's all of them. So it'd be like the Lord gave you the fruit of the spirit of love, and out of that love flows the love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, patience, self-control, gentleness, out of the one. One is the existence. So you only get one. It's a plural thing. So if you've got one, you have them all. You can't say, well, I, I, don't, I don't love, but I got joy. Well, you do love, you just don't do it right yet. But it's in you. The love of God is in you. The joy of the Lord is in you. The peace that passes all understanding is in you. The self-control is in you. You have it within you. It's just what do you develop? Now, some things, Liz, are like a watermelon size. Like you got the joy. You know, it's like, woo, real big. And, and you know, maybe your, Delonda, your self-control is like a raisin, a dried grape. No, I'm only using you as an example because I know you've got great self-control there. So, but you still have it. And it's up to you to water the self-control to grow, to cultivate it in your life to grow. With all of these fruit, it, it's all in you. It's just how much are you going to let come out of you? How much are you going to cultivate in your life so that it flows out of you in power and might? So when... Um, the Spirit fully controls the life of a believer. He produces all of these graces. Let me read that again. When the Spirit fully controls the life of a believer, He produces all these graces. The first three concern our attitude toward God. Everybody say attitude. attitude. The second triad deals with social relationships. And the third group produces principles that guide a Christian's conduct. Could you put that scripture back up there? Okay, there we go. So the first three, love, joy, peace, our attitude towards God, patience, kindness, goodness, um, our social relationships. And then the third group, goodness, faithfulness, wait a minute, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control describes the principles that guide a Christian's conduct. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Christian conduct. So, in this context, as I said, if you have one, you have them all. Amen? So the Holy Spirit is the one that does the filling, and we're the conduit by which it flows. The limitation is in our mindsets. I don't know if this is in my notes. It might have been in a, another message I did in the last week. But, you know, you, you have a hose, right? And the hose by itself is just a piece of rubber. But when you turn on that water, it's the water that flows through. The hose is the conduit, and the water flows through it, and the water does the filling. See, we are the hose. The Holy Spirit is the conduit by which it flows through us. And as we, long as the water's turned on, the flow is going, we can be able to flow with the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, and it's what comes out of the hose that's the good. The hose by itself, I can't drink it. But when you turn it on, whoo, there's something to drink. Amen? But the limitations is in our mindsets. We can't let our past dictate our future. We, we have already heard that these are produced through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings them out of you. Um, they may not be evident in your life right now. And, but now, but now, everybody say now, now. You're alive in Christ. And you have them all. We've been praying almost every week for the last month to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you've asked them, or you repeated after me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So you have the fruit of the Spirit inside of you. Amen? You have it in you. If you believe it, receive it, and walk it out. And they will begin to abound in your life. They'll begin to come forward. The love of God will start coming out of you to the point that it just pours out through you. It's just always there. You'll walk in more joy 
than ever before because you're focused on Jesus. You're walking in the Spirit, amen? You're walking in the Spirit so you're not controlled by the circumstances of your life that dictate your joy. You're not letting your life dictate your joy. You're walking in the Spirit, and you're walking in the Spirit, and as you're walking in the Spirit, the joy just keeps there. The joy just fills you. The joy just runs through you. The people are like, why are you always so joyful? Yeah, let me tell you. Then open door. Mm-hmm. You know, when I met Jesus, I got filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and he filled me with his Spirit, and I got the fruit, which is the love and the joy. And oh my gosh, that's what makes me loving, and it makes me joyful. That's what makes me, I just wake up and I'm joyful. Not because everything's perfect in life, but Jesus is. And I know him. I met him. I met him one day right here. See, and you can just, oh, you can tell a story off of that. But if you come up there and you're like, well, it's because I met Jesus. I, I did a memorial service yesterday. And The lady was 76, but she'd heard when she was a young lady, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. And she called her sister and said, we're going to hell. Her sister said, what? She said, yeah, we're going to hell. We don't know Jesus. Well, we better get to know him. (laughs) And so they got to know Jesus. And they got to know him and they served him all the days of her life. So we had a time of rejoicing yesterday because she's in heaven. But the enemy of your soul is going to do things to rob you of your joy. Because if the joy of the Lord is your strength, the enemy of your soul will do things to rob you of your joy so that your walk becomes weak. Your joy is not full. Your love cup is empty. You know, I think that's what happens in a lot of marriages too. The love cup gets empty. I always ask couples when I'm counseling, what are you going to do when the love runs out? Uh, What do you mean? (laughs) Because your love cup is going to empty at one time or another. You've got to learn how to keep that thing full. You've got to get with God. The enemy of your soul will do what he can to rob you of that joy. As a staff, we've been reading a, a specific book. It's called Hero Makers. Wonderful book. How to make heroes out of people. That's what I want to do in you, make you a hero. Amen? You should be heroes. I mean, my heroes, right now, Ed in that sound, I can I can just barely see the top of his head. There you go, Ed, that's a little better. <laughs> Mario up there, Mindy, you know, Mindy making sure that flag's waving, and, and Ed making sure that the people online are watching it right now, and Mario making sure I sound good. <laughs> <laughs> And I truly believe that next week, Children's Church is going to open up again. And it's going to be nice. And it's going to be great. And then Andy will be my hero. Andy will be out there with them kids. And some of you have volunteered to help. Yeah, we want to make heroes out of you. But there was a story in this book, in hero making, that I want to read to you. It's a rough story. Delonda said, when I read it to her, she goes, I'm not coming. (laughs) So be ready right now. Open up your heart, though. And this is what the writer wrote. He said, to help people move forward, move toward multiplication, I encourage them to see things in light of eternity, to keep moving forward, and to never give up much like the soldier. I might have to sacrifice my life and you might have to lose yours as well. Your vision must go beyond what you can do to what God wants to do. We never looked into our resources. We never checked our pocketbook. God makes his presence known as you move forward. We must say, it's not my life, but your life. It's not about me, but about you. One of our preachers in India was tied up. His attackers made him watch as they raped his wife. Sometime later, this pastor told me about their most recent baptism, which included the people who brutalized them. 
This pastor and his wife had visited their attackers, prayed for them, and forgave them. Only the love of Christ could motivate their actions. He went on to write, If I want to see the multiplication of hero makers, I must preach not just from my lips, but from my life. As I live out what I preach, I must be extreme in pouring out my life into others. If I can do it with the help of God, you can too. Wherever you serve, we stand together. We serve a great God. Let that story just sink into your heart. When we're given marching orders, there's no denying them. There's moving forward in the fruit that's been imparted to us. I know, your mind's racing right now. Thoughts of how you would have handled the situation. Revenge, murder, torture, bring in the Marines, the Army, the Air Force, drop the Moab on them. You know what the Moab is, right? Mother of all bombs. But did you have any thoughts of love for their attackers? If you put your place in their position, was your heart filled with love for their soul? See, because that's what God wants to bring us to. We may not ever experience anything like that, that extreme here in America. but you will encounter people that don't receive what you have. People that will hate you. Jesus said, they're going to hate you because they hated me. They're going to make fun of you because they made fun of me. Were there any thoughts on how you would reach your attackers with the gospel as they did? The fruit in you is only as strong as you allow it to be. The enemy of your soul, will, as I said, will do all he can to rob you of your joy. People have told me that as they press into the Lord, the enemy's been attacking them. That The more they get closer to God, the enemy's been pounding on them and stuff. The enemy knows how he can get your joy. If he can get your joy, you'll become weak and he'll take you out. That's his plan. The enemy's not looking for you to bow down and serve him. The enemy just doesn't want you to bow down and serve Jesus. That's all. He's not looking you to become a Satanist, you know, because none of us would in here. We, we, we love Jesus. But if the enemy can beat you up bad enough and you don't have enough strength to stand and you fall by the wayside, you're just not serving God anymore. And the enemy wins. How many of you want the enemy to win? No. Jesus, remember, is our protector. Our protector from the sly one that's trying to get us to drink his evil poison. I put this in my notes. Don't drink the Kool-Aid from the devil. Don't drink the stuff of this world that the enemy's trying to get you to drink. Don't entertain his actions or thoughts or even the whispers he's throwing at you. Cast them down. Stay ready in the love of God and let his joy remain in you so that you don't lose the strength the Lord has been imparting to you by the Holy Spirit. If the enemy gets your joy and makes you weak and you start losing your peace, we can get so focused on what the enemy is doing that our peace flies away. Remember, it's just the first three, our attitude towards God, love, joy, peace. See, he's working on your attitude towards God. He's trying to get you to not have a good attitude towards God. And the the key is right here, James 4, 7, it's on the screen. Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee. And as I've told you before, when you humble yourself before God, you're putting all your focus on God. You're, you're reading, you're praying, you're worshiping, you're giving, you're serving. You're putting all your attention on God. I'm not, when I started doing that, 
I stop thinking about what the devil's trying to throw at me. Cole, I don't think about what, what is the devil going to do. I don't think about that. I'm just focused on, I'm just going to serve God. And as I've done that, and the devil, the devil gets, to, he gets tired of hearing me praise God. He's like, oh, there he goes again. You know, there he goes again. Oh, man, he's praying again. Oh, my gosh. He's reading the word. That guy's singing in tongues again. As the people of God, we need to persevere. We need to persevere to the point that the devil can't stand to be around you. He just can't stand to be around you. He's just like, oh, there they go again. They're going to praise God. Uh, Tim, if you want to come back, buddy, because we're going to praise God again. <laughs> but the strength from the joy needs to carry us through to the point that we walk in peace, amen, knowing that God has got us. You've got to know that God's got you. No matter what's going on in your life right now, you've got to know that God's got you. You've got to be very aware that God's got you. No matter what's coming, what darts the enemy, fiery darts the enemy's trying to throw at you, no matter what words he's throwing at you, Eric, no matter what discouragements he's trying to bring upon you, what things he's throwing at you, how your relationship's going, it doesn't matter, Charlie. you just got to stay focused on the Lord and walk in that joy, amen? i got to maintain my joy. Why? Because that's towards God, my attitude towards God. I want, I want my attitude to be good before God. If my attitude ain't so great to you, I'm sorry, but I want it to be good before God. <laughs> That's where we got to be. Our attitude is great towards God. Let the kingdom of God prevail in your heart and in your mind. Amen? If, as the Bible says, the first three fruit are our attitude towards God, we may need to maintain a right attitude towards God so we don't get off track of the marching orders that he's given each one of us. You may, you may not want to go into all the world. You may not want to go and tell people about Jesus. You may want to say, I'll let you do that. I'll let that be your job, Pastor. But I can't do all the jobs, amen? I don't know your people. I don't even know where you work, Renee. You work in some kind of financial institution. I don't know if it's a bank or something. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where you go every day. I don't know if you stay home, work, go to prayer. Or, I don't know where you go. You know, and Cole goes all over the place. He's driving all over the counties. Esperanza goes over and helps, helps people every day. She's a caregiver. Tim's all over the place. You know, he's over here, he's over there, he's doing this, he's doing that. But I don't know your people. You know your people. You know your families. You know who needs Jesus. And if our attitude stinks, we will be ineffective in our going. Who will want to be around us if we're unloving, no joy, no peace? No one. You ever been around an unloving, unjoyful, no peace kind of person? You're like, you can't get away fast enough. Yeah, yeah I got to go. I'll see you. <laughs> and this is why the enemy will hit you hard when God starts manifesting his presence around you. Your words will start producing life and miracles as you begin to speak out with the love of God. Your words are going to produce life. Your words will produce eternal life for somebody. Think about that. Mark the words that God gives you. It's going to take somebody right out of hell. It's, it's going to be like the armor of God is going to reach into the pit. Say, this one, Mark? Yeah, that one. Start imagining it. Start believing for it. That you have this fruit inside of you. And God's going to use you to snatch people out of hell with it. He's going to pull you 
use you to pull them out of the hell. And the fruit is just going to open doors for you to make people your apprentice. To make people that want to imitate you. Those kids are going to want to imitate you, Andy. Amen? They're going to want to come and be around you. They're going to want to sit at your feet. I know, you know, we've been talking all about chairs and everything, but they're going to want to sit at your feet. Maybe we should just buy a rug. <laughs> Let them sit at your feet. It all, comes, it all comes down to this. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. In every part of our life. Let the Spirit lead in every part of your life. Don't leave anything to chance. Amen. Close the door on the devil and let the Holy Spirit have control so that you can fulfill your marching orders and go. We may not have to go through what that Indian pastor and his wife went through. But what you're going through is no less important. The battle that you're in is no less important than what, what they went through. It's very important to God because he cares for you. He loves you. But let's keep things in proper perspective. That God has got you and the Spirit is in you. And God will bring you through it. Amen. He will bring you through it. If not, he'll greet you on the other side. <laughs> That's when you read Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, Scott. You read that and he goes through and he talks, man, about, you know, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. They're so faithful. They received the prize. They received the prize. And then they go, what? Some got sawn in half. Some were, you know, killed with a sword. Some were hung. Some were crucified. They, but they got their promise win on the other side. So we have, we're going to get the promise no matter what. It's coming. It's coming to you. It's coming to you. But when your heart is set on that, you keep marching forward. You keep going forward. Top of that hill. Just think of the top of that hill. You just keep going forward. Even when you see people going down around you, you stay the course and you keep moving forward. You have marching orders to go and to speak and to do the things that Jesus did. And I charge you today, as the American soldier has, has gone forth to protect America, you take advantage of the freedom you have here and march forward building the kingdom of God. Loving people. And I want us to stand this morning and I want us to sing this old, old hymn. It's called Onward Christian Soldier. But I want you to pay attention to the words because the words are very powerful. the 
that's the only verse that I knew until pastor asked me to play and sing this. I was reading the second verse. I think it's awesome. I, want you to, I just want to read this to you while, before we sing it. At the sign of triumph, Satan's host doth flee. On then Christian soldiers, um, on to victory. This is great. Hell's foundations quiver at the sign of praise. Shout of praise. At the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices and loud your anthems. Praise. So let's sing that. At the sign of trust. Verse three. Verse three. Okay, let's sing this. Like come Father, we thank you today for the marching orders that you have given us. Lord, let it burn in our heart, Father God, of what you have imparted to us, Father. And Lord, that we don't have to be afraid, but we can go forward in your power and your might. And I pray for every one of us, God, that you help us to choose our words wisely in the days ahead. Because Lord, your word declares that you will confirm our words. So, Father, I pray for words of life over every person here today, that you would impart the Holy Spirit to them like never before, that you fill us overflowing, God, that we can go in the boldness of the Holy Spirit in us to proclaim the gospel message to everyone that we meet. Father, I thank you for these orders. I thank you for the Spirit. I thank you that you've not left us alone to do this, but that you've sent the Holy Spirit who was with us and is now in us to step out in such boldness to build the kingdom of God. Father, I pray that in the days ahead, we will hear mighty testimonies of how great you are through us. That as the conduit of the hose, Lord, that that river of water be refreshing to everyone we meet that we change our community, 
our state, our country, and the world. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand, huh? Hallelujah. All right.